Welcome to the QST of A Child. Episode 15. Yeah. Once again from isolation. Mm-hmm. So how are you coping? You doing alright with it? Yeah, I'm good. I sort of like it in some ways, but in others I don't really like it at all. Yeah, it's different, isn't it? Yeah. But I think we're coping okay, and I hope all of you are as well. So what have we got in store this episode? For my feature, I'm going to do a little bit on the Guernsey Literary Festival Write Stuff. We'll explain what that is a little bit later. And I think you are doing something about vultures and vulture poo. Yeah, I'm going to be talking about vultures. Um, Yeah, including their poo. So shall we get on with the show? Yep, on with the show. The Write Stuff. Freedom. For the past few years in Guernsey, there's been the Guernsey Literary Festival, which unfortunately this year was cancelled due to coronavirus. Mm -hmm. They get some really high calibre authors from kind of around the world to come and talk. There's fiction, non-fiction, there's children's stories. You've been to some events, haven't you? I remember some of the people signing my um, books as well. That was really exciting. (laughs) There's the illustrator and he's teaching us how to draw. Oh yeah, like yeah. Characters. We still, we still got that picture. We do. And part of the festival is the Write Stuff competition, which is a three hundred word story for local school children. And it's a good competition. And I'm fortunate through my job to be involved with it. Each year, we put together the website, which is a great fun project. Yeah. And you've entered before, haven't you? Yeah, I've actually won before. You did, but I haven't managed to coax you into entering again since. No. <laughs> But what we're going to do is look at some of the entries from this year's competition, aren't we? Mm-hmm. And the theme was freedom. And I think that's probably chosen because it's how many years since the liberation of Guernsey? 75 years. That's right, yeah. So there's three age groups. There's the primary group, the intermediate group and the senior group. So we're going to look at the winner of each. So should we start with the primary winners? Yep. Okay, so... Uh, we'll play a little clip of each story and then we'll give some of our thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. So this is called A Letter That Will Live On. A Letter That Will Live On. My dearest Sylvia, I cannot believe I haven't written since we were evacuated. Time has flown and you've missed my birthday. I'm sure my present is on its way. I'm missing you dreadfully and I hope you and Mother are safe and I bet you aren't having as much fun in Devon as I am in Windsor. Guess who I met on Wednesday? The Queen. She was opening a youth centre and I nearly tripped trying to curtsy. She asked if I missed my home. I told her, no, of course not. And I then stupidly confessed that every weekend I cycled 26 miles to London to see father. The Queen was shocked. Oh, but my dear, she said, you are our next generation. We must keep you safe. Some snitch told our house mother and she made me swear I wouldn't cycle until the war had ended. So what did you think of this story? I liked it because it was a little bit cheeky in a way and mm. a bit funny. Uh, for example, the bit where it says about the umbrella, um, are we going to get blown to smithereens? I didn't care because I had my umbrella. That was um, funny. It's actually a letter that the grandmother wrote when she was young and now her granddaughter is reading it back to her many, many years later, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really like it. And I like all the different events that happen mm-hmm. in it as well. And all of them are... Um, written with some pretty good detail and descriptions. Yeah, definitely. Um, I enjoy it. I think it's got a bit of a cheeky charm. Yeah. Should we go on to the next story? Yeah. So this is the intermediate one. So this is Suffragettes, Freedom to Women. Suffragettes, Freedom to Women. Starvation racked her stomach as ice cold water lapped her toes. Leached of warmth, Seated on a hard metal bench, she barely felt it. The hose, responsible was the least of her problems, smirking devilishly, the prison guard delighted in her panic. Suddenly, the tide was as high as her knees, hips, chest. Despite her lack of energy, she kicked upwards, towards air. Adrenaline kicked in, so did mania. Lungs set to bursting, legs burning, she thought, this is it. What did you think of it? I quite liked it. It was quite extreme as well, and a little bit sad, Mm. but it definitely um, 
well, when you read over it, there's quite a bit of emotion as well in there and lots of different description words, lots of different types of description. Yeah, I think it's quite somber as well. The, the, the beginning of it, you don't quite know what's going on. So it's but I thought, very good again, wasn't it? Yeah. Now we've got the senior winners. And this one was called A Way to Escape. I particularly like this one. But what are books, I asked, perched precariously on my grandmother's knee, looking up into her watery blue eyes. You've told me what they are, but you haven't told me why they're special. Why do we need them? Books were something from long ago, before we discovered everything there is to know, before we were trapped underground by the nature. Fire rained down on us, hiding and destroying our beautiful cities. At least, that's what they said. I never saw that. I never saw the skyscrapers that prevented the last traces of green from creeping up again, like a villain from one of those books. So what's the general gist of this story, then? This one's more about books and kind of what books are, uh, like explained with a bit more thought compared to our books are just pieces of paper. Yeah, it's about the power that books yeah. can hold and kind of maybe the power of stories. Mm-hmm. And the granddaughter, she wants to know, kind of, because they seem to hold these secrets to a past of long ago. It's then... kind of like describing how you can escape to another world through books. Exactly, yeah. And... Like, it carries war, I think, was in this one. Um, and that, I'm sure quite a few people have read that before. Mm. Um, it, it's about, like, a bombing sort of thing and then the devastation and stuff and um, evacuation life, really. Mm-hmm. Okay, do you want to move on to the next one? Yeah. So this is my bike. <laughs> I love riding around the island on my bike. But I didn't always have one. I used to waste my money on games, and I thought it was really cool. There is a teenager on our road who had a slick CR80 Honda motorbike. I was so jealous of him. One night, he left the garage door unlocked. My brain was saying, go in there, walk it out, steal it, ride it off. This one I really, really like. It's a bit kind of um, almost naughty. Mm. Uh, the person is naughty and they get put in prison for a few mm. minutes. <laughs> yeah. So I think there are a couple of different types of freedom, isn't there? Mm-hmm. In there? Like the freedom of... Oh, orig- his original freedom was he wants to go on the bike and then... Uh, near the end of the story, he, he was free from prison, really. So it's like, oh, just freedom of not being in prison. <laughs> I think all the stories, that they're all diverse. And I think everybody who entered the competition, particularly like these winners, they should be kind of really proud of yeah. what they've written. Because they're, they're fantastic. If you listen to the full stories on the rightstuff.gg website, uh, you get a better idea. But there's all different types of freedom there, isn't there? There's kind of in that last on my bike, there's two types of freedom. There's the kind of exciting freedom of thinking, I'm going to kind of break the rules and do what I want. I'm going to nick this bike. And then there's softer, more innocent freedom of just sort of being safe mm-hmm. and not being in trouble, isn't there? Yeah, like you said, in A Way to Escape with the Box, it's like the freedom of stories and actually being able to escape from maybe your reality yeah. and going somewhere I else. I think they've actually won before, the year that I won. And the suffragettes... Freedom to women, that was about some struggle, wasn't it? Where people were fighting for liberties and the right to vote. Mm-hmm. And then a lesser that will live on. What's interesting there is um, in that story near the end. Um, let's have a look at it again one second. I, yeah, the grandmother says, you reading this letter reminds me of a time when I was truly felt free. So even though the grandmother was evacuated away. Yeah. Um, I think just being somewhere new. And kind of away from her yeah, family, maybe. Being, being, like, just happy, generally, instead of just being really miserable because you're getting bombs dropped onto your head. But yeah. She was carefree at that time. So yeah. there, I think all the stories have reflected all different sides of freedom and what it can mean to people. Mm-hmm. Which is good, it's interesting. 
Now, a couple of years ago, when you were in year three, you entered the competition, didn't you? Yeah. And um, that year, what was the theme? Conflict, the opposite. You actually won the primary age group, didn't you? Yeah. I get a bit of stick about this, because obviously I'm involved with the website, but I'm in no way involved with the judging or anything to do with the competition. <laughs> it's yeah. all down to merits. It's all anonymously marked and judged. <laughs> um, so you're actually going to read your story, aren't you? Yes. So are you ready? I think so. A Change in Emotion by Anton LePedvin, Year 3, my school. <laughs> How do you feel about going home to your real parents now the war is over? Said Lacey. I feel worried. You're the only mum I've ever known. I said with a tear running down my face. I'd been with Lacey for five years. I didn't even know what my parents looked like, I thought, and I'd miss the smell of the countryside. Lacey smiled, but her eyes started to well with tears. Oh, give me a hug, said Lacey softly. It will be all fine, she whispered. The next day, I was nervous because I was seeing my parents again. We were meeting at the train station. I'll miss you, said Lacey. I replied, I'll visit every week. Once the train stopped, it was absolute chaos. People were running in all directions as their families were together again. Look, there are your parents, Lacey pointed. Suddenly my eyes lit up and my tummy felt good. My body forced me to run to them with joy. I was so happy, but sad at the same time. Bye, see you soon, I called over my shoulder to Lacey. Mum bent down to hug me, and I saw we had the same brown hair. Then Dad picked me up, threw me in the air. As our eyes met, I saw they were the same greeny blue as mine. Now I remembered what my parents looked like. We caught the train home. When I was shown to my room, I saw my favourite toy truck I had when I was two. Even now I'm seven, I still love it. It was bedtime. I asked mum to read to me, and when she'd finished, I fell asleep. I was home, at last. Very good. I remember reading that on the local radio station. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what was your idea behind your story then? Again, the evacuation. Mm -hmm. um, but I was sort of thinking, well, I just wanted to be in the countryside somewhere because previously I had read a book a little bit on the evacuation mm -hmm. and I, I did it kind of based off those events and everything. And I, was, and I thought, oh, it would be more exciting if I met my parents again as well. And actually, some of the description, like, mummy has brown hair, and then you've got the same greeny blue eyes. And mm. I thought, oh, um, might as well say that's true. And at the time, I was seven. And then five years away from my parents, I was two at the beginning. That all fitted in well. Yeah, that's pretty much what I thought. Yeah, so you, you were like a very young child who was sent away, so you hadn't seen your parents for so long, you didn't even know how they, how they looked. Yeah. Yeah, so that was kind of a bit of your inner conflict there, so it must be odd. Right? Mm -hmm. Cool. So do you think you're going to enter the right stuff next year? So I know you like writing stories, and I coax you into it. I might. I'll see what the topic is. I probably will. Yeah, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once again, well done to everybody who entered and lots of fantastic stories and you can read them all or listen to them all at write stuff that's w-r-i-t-e-s-t-u-f-f -F dot g-g and um yeah take a look fantastic work there and you can also read stories from all the previous years on the website too okay so should we move on to our next feature then where i am looking at vultures yes Vultures don't really have the best reputation, and they're definitely not on many people's top ten list of animals, are they? No. They're not exactly pretty birds, and they seem to spend their days circling high over the dead and dying harbingers of the ultimate death. Then they pick up corpses, kind of eating 
rotting under decaying flesh. Yeah. Um, and then they've got their featherless heads, which are kind of red and sticky with blood, aren't they? <laughs> Even their name, Vulture, has come to have negative connotations now. So here's a couple of uh, definitions. So, um, a person or thing that preys, especially greedily or unscrupulously, the vulture would sell out his best friend. <laughs> or a person or organisation that is eager to win advantage from other people's difficulties or problems. When a company is in crisis like this, the vultures are always hovering. So not great, is it? Mm, not really. We're going to find out if that's fair or not. Yeah. I've got a couple of pictures here of vultures. And uh, how would you describe them? Well, the first picture, its mouth is dripping with blood a little bit and its head looks pretty bloody and sticky. And, and how do the eyes and things look? It looks quite mean, doesn't it? Well, the eyes, they look mean, but kind of nice at the same time, <laughs> these ones. Yeah. <laughs> you know um, medieval doctors, what are they called? The, oh, the plague uh, doctors. Yeah. Their head looks a little bit like that. Yeah, it does actually, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And you could see that from some sort of fancy medieval drama where you want some sort of slightly sinister people. This is a bearded vulture. How does that look to you? That looks quite nice. <laughs> yeah, it's quite grand, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of got... It's got hair on its head. <laughs> yeah. And this one I think looks like a Jin Henson creation. <laughs> that one's got too much hair on its head. Mm -hmm. it looks <laughs> a bit like a rock star, isn't it? Yeah. From the 80s. Um... Yes, there's actually different types of vultures, uh, and they're not all related. So you have old world vultures and new world vultures, and also the bearded varieties, and they're not genetically that closely related. Yeah. So do you, you know what I mean by old world and new world? Sort of. So? <laughs> um, like Roman period old world, modern period new world. No. Yay! <laughs> uh, so the new world would be the Americas, and the old world would be, say, Europe, Africa, Asia. Don't worry about being wrong there. That's why we do this, it's to learn things. Okay. Yeah, so the American vultures aren't really related to the European ones. So why do you think their heads are featherless? Um, so their feathers don't get too sticky? Mm -hmm. That could stuff. be part of it, so it helps keep them clean. And it's also good for thermoregulation. <laughs> so you know what that means? Uh, like, you can get heat cameras, it's a little bit like heat, is it? Yeah, yeah, so thermo is kind of heat. Like thermometer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's helping um, them to keep cool. And do you know how else they keep themselves cool? Pee on themselves. Yes. Oh, yeah, I actually guess that. <laughs> yeah, they, they were wee on their legs. But I personally find that warms me up. Yeah. Wait, you've done it? Regularly, don't you? No. Okay. <clears throat> right, anyway, shall we move on? We already know that maybe vultures aren't people's favourite animals, mm -hmm. uh, but they've not always been viewed this way. So I thought, let's go do a bit of time travelling again. So you ready to get into the time machine? Yep. You like getting the time machine, don't you? Mm-hmm. I've even upgraded it now, so we've got a cop holder each. No! Yeah. yeah. Before we had to share one, which is a bit weird. It was. Yeah. 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 I can't share drinks. <laughs> get yourself strapped in. Click. And can you plug in the coordinates, please? We want South East Anatolia in Turkey, 9000 BCE. Do you know where we are? I actually just told you, but maybe the time travel made you forget. No, I don't. <laughs> OK. This place is called Gebekli Tepe, and it was only rediscovered, actually, in 1996. But it's like a thousand, like um, nine, ten thousand, no, older than that. Maybe 12,000 years old, this site, so it's, it's very ancient and it's kind of pushed back our understanding of human culture. Yeah. Uh, that it went back further in time than maybe everybody appreciated beforehand. So, do you know why we're here? Um, the first kind of drawings or pictures or sightings of vultures or just vultures? Well, follow me. Come have a look at this stone. Can you see what's carved into it? Um, oh yeah, there's like... Almost bird people. You know, Sphinx. It's <laughs> kind of them with bird heads instead, in a way. Yeah, this is called the Vulture Stone. And um, also, not far from here, one of the oldest cities that we've ever discovered will be founded in a couple of thousand years' time. Mm -hmm. And it's called Chatel Huvec. And there they also found very similar kind of uh, carvings and things of vultures on the walls. Yeah. Now, it's thought that these ancient people may have believed 
that vultures help to carry uh, somebody's soul to the afterlife or to the next world. It's kind of their ability to eat the dead, uh, but survive, <laughs> kind of made them a, like a barrier between life and death. Yeah, so they kind of got a good reputation there at the moment, sort of. Yeah, they're, they're seen as important kind of yeah. part of a um, spiritual kind of understanding of the world, maybe, for the people. Yeah. So then the archaeologists, they've discovered sky burials where the bodies of the dead have been laid down and picked up by vultures. Now, I actually think many of the skeletons were headless, um, and then they can tell by looking at the... Um, bones that there's kind of marks that say a vulture would leave and vultures are also really good at leaving the ligaments in place mm -hmm. where maybe other creatures wouldn't or so the skeletons are still kind of amatonically formed or correct so if you burial. pulled one of those <laughs> you, you just get a moving you can vote them like a puppet still yeah. putting their tendons um, headless skeleton puppet maybe now the practice of sky burials is still performed today by Tibetan Buddhists and Zoroastrians sometimes seems like a sign of renewal or rebirth yeah okay we better move from here though because i think our modern day clothes are going to look a bit suspicious yeah here aren't they and our, our weird behaviors so let's get back into the time machine for a little whistle stop tour of some other vulture beliefs shall we yep okay our next stop is going to be ancient egypt do you want to plug in the coordinates please <laughs> So one of the Egyptian goddesses was Nechbet. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we practiced the pronunciations beforehand, and I still get them wrong. And she was a goddess of Upper Egypt, and she was also the goddess of childbirth and the protector of the pharaoh. So it's a pretty important yeah. role there. And she was often depicted as a woman wearing either a vulture headdress or even sometimes with the head of a vulture. And her cult was linked to the eternal cycle of life and death. So again, you're seeing the vulture as maybe that in-between stage between life or death, because once somebody's died, they're eaten, but then the vulture kind of takes on their life or maybe helps to carry it. So you can imagine soaring into yeah. the sky and sort of carrying it off the They're almost the like the death messengers in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, the Egyptians understood that vultures, they actually look after their young a lot longer than many other birds do, sometimes up to three months. Yeah. Um, and they're also very protective and very nurturing of their children, so you could see there why maybe they were seen as the protector of the pharaoh. Yeah. So then maybe this uh, creature that's able to transcend the boundaries between life and death is perfect for protecting the pharaoh. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to travel a little bit more in time now to the founding of ancient Rome. Still quite a long time ago. Still quite a long time ago, you're right. Yeah. So can you pop in the coordinates, please? Okay, so do you know the story of how Rome was founded? No. But you've heard of Romulus and Remus, haven't you? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Okay. I've kind of heard that. That was quite a while ago, but mm -hmm. I've heard of it. So be on the lookout for some arguing twins, please, in the hills. Mm. Over there. Uh, yes, that's them, yes. Okay, there's Romulus and Remus fighting about where they should found the city. The Romulus, he wants to build it on the Palatine Hill, but Remus prefers the Avertine Hill. And uh, they can't decide, so they're actually going to ask the gods for a sign. Now, as you know from Discworld, <laughs> yep. the gods can sometimes be a bit naughty, can't they? Yeah. So rather than a clear signal, they seem to send two. So you, first they, they send six vultures to circle um, the Avertine Hill, which Remus is after, mm -hmm. and he spots them first. But then they send 12 around Romulus's hill. Uh, so they both think they've won. Yeah. <laughs> but you know who won in the end? Remus, I think. What's the city called? Oh, Rome. Rome, Romulus. yeah. Romulus one, that's right. Um, he kills his brother, doesn't he, I think, yeah. in the end? Yeah. Again, another sign of vultures being important messengers for the gods. Mm -hmm. How about popping over to South America for a little bit? <laughs> now, we've been to these jungles before, haven't we, when we're looking at the Mayans, so we're actually yeah. kind of in... Well, we're a bit further south now in Brazil. Mm -hmm. That's fairly familiar for us. Now, there are several stories of vulture guards. Many of the tribes believed that vultures actually kind of controlled daylight. Yeah. They were a little bit naughty, and they actually stopped the light from the sun kind of reaching the earth. So the world was in eternal darkness. Yeah. <laughs> and they kept it all for themselves. Now, in one tale, there are two brave brothers, Ai and Kiat, and they wanted to steal the light from the vulture, Yuru Botson. 
And he was a god, keeping the land in perpetual darkness. Yeah. So do you know how the brothers thought they could steal the light from him? Not really. What they did, they actually hid in the carcass of a dead animal and they waited for the bird to arrive. <laughs> and then when he landed, Fiat, he grabbed Roger Rubertson's um, leg and it was unable to escape. So it agreed to compromise with the brothers Yeah. and kind of asked them what they wanted. So they said that they wanted daylight. Yeah. It was agreed that they would share it, so night and day would be about the same length. Mm -hmm. And there's another story of another, another tribe where um, the vulture, it would capture the daylight and it would kind of wear it in jewels and crystals and diamonds and things around its neck. Because remember the picture of the vulture earlier where it had the lovely... Yeah, it had loads of um, jewels and jewellery around. <laughs> yeah, but it had like um, bright golden plumage. Yeah. Or white plumage around its neck, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Now we've got one final hop before we return to the present day. So we need to go to the Middle East now, please. In some Muslim traditions, the vulture is seen as sacred because it is believed that it saves Muhammad from the attack of a giant golden eagle in the desert. So very brave, golden eagles are massive and yeah. powerful creatures, aren't yeah. they? Now the story goes that um, the prophet, he blessed the bird with eternal life and white plumage, a symbol of wisdom and courage. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so should we return back to the present time now? Yep. I just feel funny after that time hopping, don't you? Mm-hmm. And let's hope we didn't change any history. Yeah, like killing a butterfly so the dinosaurs are still around. Yeah, and everybody's got slightly larger foreheads. Yep. Now, should we get into actually why I started looking at vultures in the first place? Okay. It was to do with their uh, poo. <laughs> funny. Right. <laughs> um... Now, actually, most vultures, they prefer to eat fresh meat, uh, but many are, they're still happy to consume rotten meat, if that's where there is around. Mm -hmm. But rotten meat isn't good for you, is it? No. Because if you eat it in Minecraft, what happens? You start losing food stuff and getting poisoned and dying. Yeah, and in real life, it's not good for you either. Okay. <laughs> but somehow, vultures seem to get away with it. Actually, um, the, the kind of the meat they're eating or their meals, it's full of bacteria that would kill most other animals. Mm -hmm. So one study, um, it discovered, this is taking swabs of bacteria from their faces. Yeah. It discovers almost 13,500 different types of bacteria on their face. So it's quite a lot, yeah? Yeah. And these include the bacteria that cause things such as botulism, gangrene, tetanus, septicemia and anthrax. Yeah. So those are some of the like, most deadly things we know. So botulism, it's one of the most toxic substances in the world. But when they examined their poo, yeah. the scientists, this is, how many species of bacteria do you think surviving then? Mm. Without looking at my notes. <laughs> um, I don't think as many. Um, a few less. About half, maybe a little bit less than half. 6,000 or something then? Something like that. Wrong. It's actually only 1,500. Oh, come on. That's a lot gone, isn't it? Yeah. So I've got a quote here from Gary Graves. He's the creator of birds at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. They're coming into contact with almost every kind of pestilence you can think of, and apparently they're fine. So what's happening in the guts of these birds? <laughs> so what is happening in the guts of these birds? You don't know. <laughs> Well, it seems a few things are, okay? The first, the stomach acid in the vulture is up to ten times stronger than ours. Wow. I must get a bad heartburn sometimes. That must be annoying. Their, their poo and vomit is actually creating a radio tower on the US-Mexico border. Because <laughs> it's so strong. These, nice. Yeah, it's what um, some vultures would do as well. If they're threatened or something, they, they'll vomit mm -hmm. to ward it off. Because you can see it's quite a deadly weapon. Yeah. Now, they've also got lots of antibodies that will help fight off some of the infections, including those that cause botulism. Then also vultures, it seems that they've got some special nerve endings um, which are actually resistant to neurotoxins, mm. so they're not even affected by them. So it's probably down to like millions of years of evolution, and it's kind of made them very special indeed. Yeah. So they've got their own niche in the food chain, haven't they? And it's actually a really important one. And they're doing something that other animals can't, because a lot of other things, they might scavenge on those bodies and they'd they die. Yeah. Uh, so could you actually imagine what parts of the world would be like without them? Um, smelly, rotten and 
dead. Yeah, because there's, say in America, I think there's kind of thousands of deers killed every year on the roads. Yeah. Um, so they're an important part of cleaning up road and things. Mm-hmm. Um, because, yeah, you need to get rid of those bodies. Because you might think vultures are horrible or disgusting, but it's much better with them than without them, yeah. isn't it? In India, where there's been a drug introduced, I think into cattle, I think it was, um, that's actually poisonous to the vultures. Oh, the... yeah, it's like the cattle and the cows, the dead cows, and then the vultures die because um, the cows are given the drug. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's also led to an increase in rabies there, because there'll be sort of wild dogs will go into the area, which are infected with rabies. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's more wild dogs there, and they've been biting people and spreading rabies through that. So it has so many knock-on effects from the yeah. effects kind of the ecosystem. But then there are hopes that maybe with a better understanding of how vultures survive and are able to kind of cope with all these different bacteria and disease and things that we'll maybe be able to find treatments or cures. And then going back to droves again, um, for another quote, we need to find out what genes are associated with the resistance to botulism, for instance. If we can do that, then we can find out if there are any genotypes in humans that can confer this type of immunity. Eventually, that might lead to gene therapies or genetic engineering in humans to the point where we could eat rotten meat if we wanted to. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not actually sure if I want to eat rotten meat, even through amazing genetic engineering. Are you? Um, I don't see why I'd need to very often. Yes, it's an interesting idea. I think we'd be better off... Unless you want to be a superhero called Rotten Meat Man. Rotten Meat, yeah. <laughs> I might draw Rotten Meat Man sometime. <laughs> if you do, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. So, it's an interesting idea, which I'm not totally convinced by myself. But he's right on the idea that maybe we'll be able to find things out from vultures that will actually help us yeah. with some medical things. Particularly with um, problems with like modern day antibiotics becoming less effective. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you feel about vultures now? Are they more like um, some of the ancient stories where they were gods and kind of worshipped? Or are they more like the modern meaning of like these scraggly creatures that I are I think praying? they're kind of... They're so old special things, really. Mm. And then some some of them look really awesome and cute, don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like the... Um, the bearded feathered. vulture. As well, the... One that had really, really, really strange kind of hair stuff. Orange mm-hmm. feathers on their hair. Yes. Yeah, I put those in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. So they certainly have their place to play, don't they? Yeah. And maybe they need a bit more respect than yeah. perhaps they've been given. Mm-hmm. So there you go, that's vultures and their poo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's another episode. Yes. Go on. Really well, I think. I, I, I'm i sort of surprised that we're in episode 15, because I, I knew... Well, it's been quite a while. It's been over six months. Mm-hmm. But episode 15, it's a big number compared to 10. Yeah, it is. And we actually had a review on iTunes, didn't we? Which is pretty yeah. good. And another rating. And we had a f- another rating on Podchaser as well. But we don't have enough, because we've been going, like you said, 15 episodes, more than six months, and we... We need ratings and reviews, please. Yeah, anyone who's listening to this, please spread the word of our podcast, The Curiosity of a Child, and follow us on The Curie Child Pod on Twitter. That's right, yeah. All um, three of you that listen to us, please spread the word. Because if you spread it to one more person... That could be another 300 people. Your maths... It's gone wrong, just like yours. It has, yeah. Listen to our Halloween special for that, it's quite embarrassing. Yeah. I I still don't know how you did that. <laughs> I don't know either. Yeah, my brother commented on that as well. He wasn't impressed. Although you do have numerical dyslexia. I do, honestly. If such a thing exists. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so let's let the good public of the world get back to their isolation, shall we? Yeah, be bored. So, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. And um, respect those vultures. Yeah. Bye. Respect. Bird people.